doing some surveillance on a slaughter farm in Miami, Florida. On this farm, they're killing the sledgehammers and butchering alive. I think one of them saw me on a, uh, they patrol this area on ATVs. Threats have been made for the past 13 years on my life. I'm not too popular in these areas. When they weren't chasing me with sledgehammers and axes, I would be getting phone calls. I would be getting emails. I would be getting messages on social media. An undercover operation sheds light into the cruel treatment of animals at a West Palm Beach farm. The animals behind us residing in this torture operation had a voice today. When people would be arrested in interrogation rooms, they would tell law enforcement, that guy Kudo had better watch his ass because there are bounties on this guy's head. He's the only one taking this industry down and no one wants that person breathing anymore. So Richard Kudo is an interesting guy, to say the least. So right now we are in Area 97, and we're just going over some mappings of some slaughter farms and animal fighting farms. He sailed on the America's Cup team, like extreme sports guy. He was also a property flipper in Miami, in South Beach in the 2000s when the market was quite hot. And it's where I blossomed financially. It's where I made my money and made my nest egg. But I had a void. I had a void of doing something more important with my life. So Kuda was volunteering with the SPCA back in 2008. Basically mucking stalls, doing whatever work they needed around the barn. And they got a distress call one day. Uh, from the police, uh, because the SPCA would often help relocate, you know, animals that the police would find in distress. So, you know, I went out there driving my Range Rover, you know, leaving South Beach. And they came across at a sort of butcher's farm that the police were at, they came across this horse, beautiful horse, brown with white on its nose. He had a broken leg, he was emaciated, and I walked up to him and he put his head in my arms and he just put all his weight on me. And right then and there, I started falling for this animal. But underneath the horse's lip on its gums was tattooed a code. And they were kind of curious to know what that meant. And it turns out that racehorses are tattooed under their lips to show where they're from and what their pedigree is and they belong to. And so, this horse, the horse is named Freedom's Flight. Uh, the, the, the horse had broken its leg during a race. So I tracked his lineage, and it was shocking that I learned of his bloodlines that it came from some of the more famous racehorses on the planet. How could this horse end up at an illegal slaughterhouse? It boggled my mind. He ended up adopting him. Freedom's Flight still lives at his compound in Florida. Um, sort of got him going into this world of, of underground horse butchering. These are slaughter horses here. And we have a mare down here. She's clinging to life right now. The SPCA was not an organization that was geared towards me or anyone else going undercover and investigating these people, which is the only reason why I started the animal recovery mission. The Animal Recovery Mission taped and exposed the property while conducting an investigation. We basically go undercover where no one else will. <laughs> in the public sector, in the private sector, if they're disregarding something as far as animal cruelty, Arm will take it on. It's something that is so incredibly important, and it's become my life's mission. Oof, he is so skinny. I would just cut checks and rip out, you know, my bank accounts to, to, uh, to fund it without thinking about it. The guy right here and his wife who started the farm. And to be honest, I don't know how much money that I've spent, but it's close to the seven figures over. And it's, it's been worth it. I'm dealing with the USDA right now. Um, 
on a horse meat buy. I've basically been in better with some horse killers. So horse meat internationally is a pretty commonly eaten food, not on the level of beef or pork, but it's popular in a lot of cultures in Japan, Central Asia, France, um, and in Cuba. And a lot of Cuban Americans live in South Florida, and many of them still want to eat horse meat. They're eating horse meat for medical purposes. They think that it cures blood disorders, that it helps with side effects from chemotherapy. But all horse meat, whether it's imported or horses are slaughtered and butchered in this country for human consumption, it's illegal. This is roughly 30 pounds of horse meat purchased in Palm Beach County. They've actually cut this horse meat into small steak-like fillets. In Florida, the problem is that many times laws geared towards protecting animals are not being upheld by law enforcement, prosecutors, judges and juries. And that's extremely, extremely frustrating. The laws in Florida are still too weak. If you are a first time felony animal abuser, it is unlikely that you will get prison time. You may get county jail time, uh, but that even would be, uh, in some cases, a stretch. There's really not a whole lot I can do with them, with, even if they plead guilty or they're found guilty, because most judges, even in the most horrible crimes, do not put them in jail, will not put them in prison. So they're placed on probation. Animal abuse here is so underreported because there simply are not the resources for the police departments, the sheriff's department, animal care and control to go out and really investigate these crimes. So right now I'm in the C9 Basin. I just arrived to a, a really nasty property with four completely emaciated horses. The C9 Basin is this patch of, of brushy land wedged between Miami and the Everglades. And it's really meant to be an ecological buffer zone. It's not really meant to have humans living there. Um, but lots of people do live there. Here are the horses. This is the kill area here. That's the rug that they're covering the horses with after they remove the meat. When I first started investigating the basin at the beginning of 2009, law enforcement wouldn't even go into the basin. No one would go into the basin uh, and uphold laws certainly wouldn't go in there to investigate crimes against animals, which was why horse meat was flourishing as an industry. This area is pretty lawless. A local paper in Miami called it the closest thing America has to a Wild West outpost. And having been there a couple times, I can attest to that being true. And then people's pet horses start being stolen. Usually someone's pet horse, their pony, they'll come to the barn in the morning and either the horse is, to is vanished or, you know, a couple hundred yards away and a trail of blood away, there's a perfectly butchered and filleted carcass of what used to be your pet pony. Not only was my horse stolen, he was butchered. He was tied up to a palm tree. So all these are blood stains here? Yeah. When I started going in to the basin in 2009, I was still a developer, but I knew Hundreds of thousands of animals were in there being brutalized with everyone ignoring the crimes against them. Uh, animals were killed in really inhumane ways, you know, being stabbed in the chest or shot with low caliber guns, their throats slit, being tortured, boiled alive, really horrific stuff. And, and to see his videos, you know, he has a massive trove of undercover videos is pretty scary stuff. This is Kudo with Arm. I am investigating an illegal slaughter farm. I didn't know what I was doing, completely and utterly untrained. I am armed, but um, I still don't feel that safe. And I started to infiltrate properties, um, some of them legally, some of them illegally. And I started to document the crimes against the animals. You see a horse, doesn't look like he's in great shape. Before he got involved, there really wasn't a lot of policing of this world. 
the police down there have a lot on their plates in terms of murder and robbery and credit card fraud. And so animal cruelty was not really high on their list of priorities. I think that when you have a state where animal cruelty is way too prevalent and our laws are way too weak, it's important to have someone like Richard Kudo out there. He's someone who's a true believer, who takes risks and sometimes crosses the line to get these secret videos out to the public. I understand his passion behind it, but the way he goes about it is not the way one should go about it if you're going to successfully prosecute these animal cruelty cases. I investigated the Sinai Basin for roughly six months, and I comprised files of roughly 100 properties, illegal properties, and I presented it to law enforcement, but I also collected violations, building violations, zoning violations, um, environmental violations, while I was collecting crimes against animals. So I'm just coming out of the slaughter farm now. And after roughly six months of just about every night infiltrating every single property that I possibly could in the basin, I created a report. And the police, they're shocked by what's going on in the basin, but all, not only from an animal rights perspective, but also from a zoning and, and codes perspective. And the investigation of the C9 Basin actually led to Operation Restore. And it was one of the largest operations in history of the state of Florida. Thousands of agents tactically hitting the entire C9 Basin. Just after dawn, an army of regulators and police deployed to shut down slaughter farms. It was just a massive takedown of illegal activity that was going on in the C9 Basin. You know, 17 cockfighting rings, over 400 illegal structures, you know, hundreds of citations issued for dumping and butchering and animal cruelty. It was the most incredible thing that I had ever seen. And all of those nights infiltrating these properties, all of those nights being chased with machetes and axes, the danger that I put myself in, um, it paid off. So after the raid, Governor Charlie Crist signs a law that basically increases penalties for slaughtering horses. And to Kudo, this seems like it should be, you know, the end of the story, the sort of climax, the, and it's actually the end of Act One <laughs> in this story. So Kudo is on a high, uh, you know, you can almost hear the, the happy music playing as he's awarded Citizen of the Year by the Miami New Times. But he starts becoming more paranoid about the enemies that he's making. Butchers do not like him. They have followed him. They have shot at him. Kill buyers, people all over the country who are buying horses to export for meat, don't like him. And so his, his paranoia was actually quite justified. All these mofos know who I am and what I look like, and they don't like me. <laughs> There was one year, I believe I moved close to seven different times because they were finding my address in utilities when I would put my name under an electric bill or a cable bill. The police and the local authorities were kind of like, all right, we, we made some arrests, we did some enforcement, let's move on to other topics. Uh, whereas he wasn't able to let it go. I wasn't looking in the past, in my accomplishments, I was looking at the future of what still needed to be done. So after the raid, he begins fundraising quite aggressively. And in addition to being very good at garnering media attention, he's very good at opening people's wallets. And he goes from 100,000 to 200,000 to 500,000 to you know, several million dollars a year in annual uh, income from, from donations. Undercover video of animal cruelty captured at a popular farm in Northwest Indiana is under review. He starts doing undercover operations in Indiana and, and other states abroad in, in Asia, looking at animal cruelty there. Greetings from Bangladesh. Um, and the vision is that from the springboard of the C9 Basin, he will catapult into you know, much larger operations. But what he doesn't realize is that the C9 Basin story is not finished at all. We went into the C9 Basin at Christmas time two years ago. 
and we saw a blacked out fence and heard animals screaming and knew that that was an illegal slaughterhouse. So we walked in and sure enough, they were butchering every animal you could imagine alive. Goats, sheep, pigs, birds. So we started to buy pigs and goats for meat for human consumption. Then we started purchasing horse meat. And this took back and forth, we're talking two years. This is a long investigation called Operation Genesis. They start building a case file against the owner of, of the farm. Oh yeah, there it is. So they'll chop it up, put it in these bags. Yep. And in November 2020, Kudo invited me down to Florida to be part of the raid on the slaughterhouse. Last night, the Department of Health announced that there are two presumptive positive cases of coronavirus disease in the state of Florida. So the pandemic hit in March, uh, about a week after I was in South Florida with Kudo. Uh, and this really put a hamper on his plans. I had to pull my investigators out of the field. Months and months later, we went back and forth with emails with law enforcement, and I got a very bad feeling that law enforcement did not want this case for some reason. The plan was basically kind of a Hail Mary. They were gonna go undercover that morning, bring some evidence out, and then call 911. We called 911, law enforcement responded, and gave excuses on why they couldn't make arrests. The police immediately knew who Kudo was. You could see how annoyed they were at him. And you could see that they really didn't want to be there. So they wrote up, a, you know, some notes, they opened a case file, and they basically told us to get lost. When it's disregarded, you throw up your hands, you, you let out a sigh, you're, you're so disheartened. You question your tactics. Should I have brought this case to law enforcement to begin with? I think someone who's out there to hold accountable the worst of the animal abusers is a good thing. It's just that sometimes we can't use his evidence because it doesn't meet the standards of admissibility in a courtroom. You cannot just go in and film people and record people. We do have laws on that. No matter what you see, what you hear, you cannot, as a private citizen, film people, record people without their consent in the state of Florida. And you cannot continually go in and have them slaughter an animal in front of you just so you can film what they're doing. Over the years, over the last decade, their patience has worn increasingly thin to the point where now, you know, they, they, want, they, they say they want to work with them, but they give very little uh, indication that that's, that's actually true. It, it seems like they really would like him to, to go away. You question everything about yourself, about your organization. Are you really making an impact? Are you really helping animals? I created ARM to create change no matter what. I'm not here to make friends with prosecutors or law enforcement or anyone else. I'm here to help animals and that's it. That's the difference between being an activist and a prosecutor. You know, being an activist is to make a point and being a prosecutor is to do justice and you can only do justice within the confines of the courtroom with rules of evidence. So I guess you have to ask yourself, do you wanna make a point or do you wanna make a difference? Working with law enforcement and government has very little meaning to me. My main goal at ARM now is to educate. At times, even change diets, because if people didn't eat meat, then there wouldn't be these markets for me to, to investigate. They would not exist. I will never, ever give up. I'll strive to make change and to help animals and live a good, decent, ethical life for them.